Thailand is being very careful and cautious on uh, about the coronavirus, and so um, it doesn't look like we'll be able to head to Thailand until after the baby is born um, and is seven weeks old in uh, February, uh, mid-February. So that's kind of the time frame we're we're looking at now. Um, and so in the interim, we've been studying language, studying Thai with our Thai tutor uh, online through Zoom. Um, five days a week from 7 to 11 p.m. Uh, for four hours. And, uh, so it's been uh, really good to have something to do uh, and to be able to uh, at least uh, do something in, in preparation for, for when we get there. And uh, language is going very well. God has been gracious to us. Um, Wallace is very good at remembering the vocab, and, and uh, I'm very good at remembering how to read. So all the, there's so many rules on uh, the tone markers and, and class of letters, and, and it's, a, it's a lot, but uh, uh, we're doing um, very, very well compared to what the expectations were uh, for being able to learn language online. They didn't think it could be done, and so God's been gracious to us, and, and um, we've got two other girls who were uh, planning on going to Thailand uh, with us that are studying with us as well. And uh, so if you would be praying for, for us as we continue learning Thai um, and to, to not be discouraged that we're uh, not on the field yet, uh, but that we are still being diligent to prepare and study and, and um, so that we can be ready uh, by the time we get there. And it, it, it's entirely possible that we may be able to share the gospel on the first day that we set foot in Thailand, which is just incredible. And uh, so that... That is uh, my motivation to, to keep working really hard on, on learning the language. And, um, we can read uh, the Bible in Thai. Don't necessarily know what all the words mean, but we can sound like we know what we're doing. <laughs> and um, we're studying, or we're learning a, a gospel presentation, uh, just a simple sort of creation to the cross type of, of uh, gospel presentation in Thai. Um, and uh, one of our... Uh, language study mates has had the opportunity to actually share portions of that with a, uh, a, a Thai person um, in her town as she's uh, going to the Thai restaurant and ordering food and developing relationship with this Thai lady. And so that's been a really huge blessing and, and encouragement for, for all of us who are studying Thai to have uh, something to look forward to. Um, and so we would also ask if you would please pray for the journeymen who are stuck in the U.S. that haven't been able to get out to the field and and those who are at training now and, and are supposed to be at training in the fall, um, the, the future looks uh, is going to look different for them. And so please pray that, uh, that God would give them wisdom on what to decide and, and the leadership to be able to uh, help them guide in that decision and, and make wise decisions while um, a lot of missionaries are stuck um, in the U.S. and not able to get to the field. But another encouraging thing is that the church that... Uh, our, our team works really closely with in Thailand is has been stepping up um, and doing a lot more than they had in the past um, because the missionaries aren't there um, and they've been very well equipped to do the work and they are doing that work and so that's been that's been a huge encouragement there are Thai believer or Thai people coming to faith in Christ during this uh, pandemic um, and that's just that's so encouraging uh, to hear especially in Thailand, which is uh, a dark place, uh, not very many believers. And so to hear that there are those who are coming to Christ is very encouraging. Um, and it's very encouraging to know that y'all are praying for us, and, and uh, we were praying for y'all. And, and so we're just excited to be back and hang out for a week. Um, it's too short, far too short, but we will cherish this time. Thank you very much. Before we open our Bibles, let's, let's do go to the Lord in prayer for Tyler and Wallace and Titus and uh, all the other missionaries that find themselves in, in frustrating or different situations and certainly what they expected and wanted to be in. And, and But we know that the Lord is doing something because he's absolutely sovereign in everything. So, Caleb, would you lead us in a prayer for uh, those gals, please, sir? Thank you. 
All right, if you guys have your copy of the Word of God this morning, please be turning to uh, Luke chapter 6. Let's see if Tyler and I can get everything running right this morning. Luke chapter 6, we're going to read... Begin reading in verse 27. If you have a helmet, it might be a good idea to go ahead and put that on. Perhaps a chin strap would be great as well. It's going to be a very confronting and convicting passage this morning as we talk about loving our enemies. So do what you need to do to prepare your own soul. These are not easy passages to walk through. Luke chapter 6. Again, let me begin in verse 27 with the words of our Lord. But I say to you who hear, it's just for a particular group of people, those who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners knowing to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great And you will be sons of the Most High. For God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful then, even as your Father is merciful. I told you, I guess last week, we're coming across some of the most difficult passages that you're going to find in the Gospel of Luke. And when you look at this whole group of passages, or this sermon, if you will... This is the most difficult section in the sermon to really grasp or get a hold of. And in hearing these instructions from our Lord, you can understand why there are so many different interpretations of this particular sermon. Anytime you come across what is really challenging, seemingly impossible passages, many many will try to find something else to do with them rather than just interpret them literally. We don't like to be so confronted and convicted by our behaviors because when you think about it, unfortunately, there's just no lot, not a whole lot of difference between us 
in the person who does not know God when you begin to dissect our character and how we respond to particular things. So this morning, before we jump into the command of our Lord to love our enemies, I want to sort of prepare your mind with two distinct thoughts. First of all, I want us to think about the character of God before we get to the instruction to love our enemies. I want to begin in a different way than I usually do, somewhat philosophical way. I don't usually do that, but when we have to think about the character of God, we need to begin to put things together and think a little more broadly. So I want to be a little more philosophical than normal, but guarded and guided by Scripture nonetheless. When you think about the character of God, there are so many glorious attributes of God that describe Him. And so when you think about all the different attributes that describe God, you realize that it's really impossible to choose just one word to describe God. So many people try to do that, but I don't think that's necessarily, or I don't think that's really possible to describe God with just one word. In fact, the word character or attributes is really not even a good word because when you think about my character per se, you're going to find some good things about my character, you're going to find some bad things about my character, but when we consider the character of God, you're not going to find good and bad. You're just going to find what is eternally good, right? Scripture uses the word arete, R, I mean A-R-E-T, long E, arete, which in 1 Peter is translated excellencies. Let me read you the passage. I know you're familiar with it. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you, speaking to the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of God who has called you out of darkness and into light. Scripture doesn't even use the word character of God. It uses the word excellencies of God. Now, that's not even a word that I don't think I've ever used outside of Scripture, excellency. But we do use the word perfect pretty often. And so when we think about the character of God or the excellencies of God, it might be better for us to think about God's attributes as God's perfections. That's really what they are, the perfections of God. Now, when you think about this, God is completely all of his perfections always. Or God is perfectly all of his perfections all the time. And when you begin to think about his perfections, you realize that what you're doing is you're bringing them together to describe God, the essence, who God is through his perfections. But there's another problem. Even though we do that, we divide out, if you will, the perfections of God. For instance, God is holy. We might be able to define somewhat of what holiness is, but we can never understand the depth nor the magnitude of the holiness of God. So even though we might define the perfections of God, you can't ever understand how deep, how glorious, how high, how awesome each and every single one of them are. God is fully and completely every single one of his perfections or his attributes. Now, the Bible most often does what we do. If you're going to describe someone's character, you begin to use adjectives that make sense to us, right? God is mighty. All the time, God is awesomely mighty in the fullest sense. God is righteous. Again, we might be able to define righteous, but we can never understand the scope or the depth of God's righteousness. The Bible uses God is one, God is great, God is true, God is eternal, God is faithful, God is holy. And so we understand that because we use adjectives to describe one another as well. And we begin to put all that together and begin to get a better, broader picture of the character of God. Sometimes though, scripture does something that we don't ever do that I I can think of. Scripture uses nouns rather than adjectives to describe God's character and We hardly ever, if ever, do that. In fact, when it uses a noun four times in the New Testament, it doesn't use an article. For instance, let me help you there. We would say joy has a spirit, meaning part of me is a spirit. I have a spirit, right? 
But when the Bible speaks about God in John 4, it says God is spirit noun. Meaning, He is not a spirit, He is spirit. The fullness of God is spirit. There is no part of Him that is not spirit. See, that's a little more difficult for us to get our mind around. 1 John 1.5, God is light. Not God is a light. Not there is a part of God that is light and a part that is not. God is light, period. In all of His fullness, He is light. There is no part of Him that is not light. And when you read 1 John, you realize it's in the context of righteousness. So there is no part of God that is not righteous or unrighteous. He is altogether totally and completely righteous or He is totally and completely light all the time. Another example is Hebrews 12. God is, no article, consuming fire. God is, by quality, consuming fire. Meaning God is altogether, totally, completely consuming fire. In the context of Hebrews 12, that's in reference to judgment and wrath. You think about that. There is no part of God that is not consuming fire. And therefore, how should we come before God? With fear and trembling always. The last one brings us around to where we want to be with the context of love our enemies. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Not God is loving or God can be loving, but rather God is always, in all of His being, love. There is never a day when He is not love. There is never a day or a moment where He is not both. Consuming fire and love. See, I said philosophical. <laughs> That's hard to get our minds around. He's not like us where Joey wakes up one day and he's filled with stubbornness and grumpiness. And then the next day Joey wakes up and he's filled with laughter and joy in his heart. God is not like that at all. Every day he is the fullness of what he is in every way, shape, and form. It's what makes him God. And so when we think about God, He is fully and completely always love. The fullest experience, therefore, that you and I can ever experience love is in God. And the fullest expression of love comes from God. And when was that? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave us His only Son. So the greatest expression of the character of God is the cross and the greatest experience of that we can ever have is when we come to God through faith in Christ. When I begin to talk about love, I realize, though, that for many of you, your heart hesitates because our passion for God and His Word makes us careful with the love of God for fear that someone might misunderstand and take the love of God for granted. I realize that. While there will always be those individuals whose God, really y'all, is nothing more than a golden calf, who never judges, who never fills with wrath, who never holds them accountable. He's just loving, loving, loving. Even in their sin, He will wipe that away and, and love them to death. We have to remind ourselves, even though there will always be golden calf gods and people who worship those false gods, we can never say too much about the love of God. It is absolutely immense God's love is inexhaustible and at the same time his wrath is inextinguishable that is who our God is and since that is true it's absolutely little wonder that when we see the son of God come to earth what do we see we see the fullest expression of love right love that is indescribable love like we've never seen or experienced the love of Calvary when Christ dies. God is love, period. So that's the character of God as we begin, begin to consider this command, if you will, to love your enemies. And the reason that I'm starting here is there's two bases for him to say love your enemies. And the first is based on love your enemies based on who I am. The second basis that he is going to use in these passages to command us to love our enemies is the fact that he is Lord. It's the character of God and it's the command of the Lord. So let's put alongside the perfections of God this idea that he is Lord. And we have to remember 
that because of the finished work of Calvary, God the Father has made God the Son Lord. And that's another thing that you and I have very little knowledge or experience of, of a relationship between a Lord and a student or a master or a disciple or anything like that. Luke's going to record for us in Acts 2.36 the words of Peter when Peter concludes his first sermon with these words, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus Christ is Lord. He has authority over us. His words command us. Again, you need to spend time in both of those thoughts. Who is God? He is Lord. And meditate on both of those and you can understand the commands that come to us in Scripture because they're always a reflection of who He is and it's always an expression of of his lordship in our lives. So these two bases for this one truth, love your enemy. You think about that. Love your enemy. This command, if you get out of commentary, going to send you in a lot of different directions, but most of them base it on the, the idea that this command is actually hyperbole or an exaggerated speech or language. This is not hyperbole. This is God's command to his children. Again, I told you that it's bracketed with two ideas. So look at 620. Look at the word that he uses. His very first words as he comes down the mountain and he lifts up his eyes on his mathetes or his disciples. You could translate it disciples or students. Again, it's a picture of his lordship over us. He sets his eyes on his disciples and he begins to speak to them. And in the process of speaking to him, he says, first word of instruction, very first word, love your enemies. Now, Jesus uses the word mathetes, disciples, but Paul uses a different word as he grows in his relationship with the Lord. And that's the word doulos, which is translated what? Slave. Paul advanced his relationship with the Lord and he understood that he was the Lord's slave. All of his personal rights, all of his personal privileges, Paul himself had been removed from the equation and the only thing that was of any consideration was what God said, God's will. So as command comes from the Lord, Paul moves without question. See, he understood that relationship of lordship. But Jesus doesn't just begin this sermon to his disciples with the word disciple, or yeah, with the word disciples, but he also concludes the sermon. Look at verse 46, 49, the end of the sermon. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? That's bizarre. Why would you refer to me as Jesus Christ, Lord, and then go about the process in your life of just ignoring me? Whatever I say in my word, you just ignore. You do your own thing. You live your own way. Why would you ever call me Lord? That makes absolutely no sense to him. And so couched in the middle is love your enemies. And on both ends is I'm Lord. I am Lord over your life. But not just that. He uses this word here often. Look at verse 27. But I say to you who hear. Here's the problem when I get into the text of love your enemies. You're going to phase out because it just seems unrealistic. A bit, especially when I begin to define your enemies and Tyler was kidding me. You know, most people would preach this in the context of marriage. Love your enemies. I, your spouse. Get along. That's not the context. The context is someone who hates you, abuses you, wants to destroy you. The context is Jesus hanging on the cross and them mocking, spitting, beating, and he does not revile in return. That's the context. And so when I begin to jump into this, the word hear is going to be placed before you whether or not you're actually going to hear. And I'm not talking about your physical ears. When I say love your enemies, will you actually humble your heart and repent and receive the truth. That's the word here. 
It's not just listen, it's listen and do. In fact, again with the end of the sermon, look at verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me, and notice, and hears my words and does them, that's hearing. He's like a man who builds a house on a foundation of a rock. But 49, the one who hears and does not do them, that one is not even hearing. He builds his house on a ground without a foundation. So again, the whole message, the whole sermon, the first command to love your enemy is couched in the idea that he is Lord. The second one, the second basis, again, back to his character, look with me at verse 35 and 36. Love your enemies, do good, lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And notice, you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Now listen, if you want to meditate on the character of God, I suggest that you begin with the idea that God is merciful. I think that will be by far the easiest for you to grasp because if you're born again, you understand that you have no right to be considered a child of God. And if you walk through the gates of glory and spend eternity in heaven, I think you'll understand that the only reason you're there is because God is merciful. Amen. Not that you deserve it. And I, begin, I think if you will begin to meditate on the idea that God is merciful, you will really begin to grasp that because of your own personal experience. But not just that. You think about the people that we're surrounded with. You think about some of your family that are unbelieving. You think about some of your co-workers that are unbelieving. Right now, what is their lungs being filled with? Air. And where does that air come from? From the mercy of God. You think about the unbeliever. His heart, his heart is filled with love for his spouse. His heart is filled with joy for his children. The lost man's back is filled with strengths and his hand's ability. He's able to produce something good and perhaps sell it or, or use it to make a living. And he provides for his family. That man has a house. That man has clothes. That man fills his body with food. All the while, that man's life is in the hand of God. The very God that he refuses to thank. The very God that he refuses to worship and recognize. And God is merciful all the while. Giving that man his breath, his life, his strength, his family, his home, the roof. It all comes from God. You begin to think about that and you go, my goodness, surely you are without question merciful. Even for a man who despises you and verbally abuses the idea of God, God holds that man in his hand in mercy. And that man has life. Love your enemies. Why? Your Father is merciful. You be like your Father. So as the born-again, Spirit-filled children of God in our love to our enemies, we model the character of the Father. Now, love your enemies. Our flesh recoils a little bit. And let me tell you, the only reason you recoil is because of sin. Sin has ruined the image of God in which you were created. And the only reason we begin to justify, the only reason a commentary would ever diminish the significance of this command is because of the idea that we're so soaked with sin from head to toe. And we cannot even consider the things of God nor the character of God. But through the gospel, the image of God that has been given to us by grace is in the process of being restored. And as it is being restored, we learn then to walk in this wonderful, merciful character of God. So it's through the grace of God that we're even able to consider the command to love our enemies. All right, let's get to it. What does this actually look like if we're going to love our enemies? Well, I divided this up this way, in this particular way, and I think you can understand it a little better. Verse 27, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, meaning do good to those who hate you, 
Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, don't resist. Just offer the other one also. And for one who takes away your garment, your shirt, do not withhold your coat either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, steals from you, do not demand them back. In other words, to those who hate you, curse you, abuse you, and strike you, in turn you do good, bless, pray for, and don't resist. That's how you love your enemies. It's very active. You're not loving your enemies to be passive. You're not loving your enemies by just not responding to the hurt. That's not love. That's humanism. That's passivity. That's not godly. Godly love to those who despise and reject us, and that is growing, by the way, in a significant way. The love of God is very active in responding in a way of doing good, blessing, not just doing nothing, praying for, not resisting. And so, this is the love of Christ. And so this is the love of his followers. What Jesus is saying, you have to understand, Jesus is about to do. Love your enemies. He's literally about to love his enemies and die for them. And you think about that, what is Jesus responding to? Well, this is what he's not responding to. He's not responding to those who abuse him, who strike him, who curse him, who spit on him. He's not doing what he's doing in response to them. Jesus is doing what he's doing in response to the Father. And so when he commands us to love our enemies, we have to understand we're not responding to circumstances. We're not responding to people. We're called to respond to God. In other words, I always, in the spirit and strength of God should love because I'm responding to the love that I've received from God while I was hating Him, you see. And so it's well within reason that we love our enemies for God has loved us who were the ones who ignored and abused and in cases cursed and hated Him. All of this kind of comes down to verse 31 which is known as the golden rule and you wish and as you wish that others would do to you do to them it's interesting that the world quotes this passage but it's horribly misunderstood by the world the world reads this passage as always a message to the other guy in other words if you will stop being hateful and be kind then i will stop being hateful and in turn be kind to you the world never considers that this is actually a message for you personally. Meaning it doesn't matter what they're saying or doing. You always love. This is Christian love. Because Christian love is never because of love. I say this often. Christian love is not because of love. Christian love is in spite of love. That's how we respond in love. We always love in response to whomever and or whatever because we are always responding to the love of Christ and not experiences. He goes on to say, if you're kind to those who are kind, if you're loving to those who are loving, if you're giving to those who deserve, you have only the very same way as sinners. Why in the world would you ever expect to benefit from that? The love of Christ, the love of Christians, is willing to exceed all hate, all cursing, all abuse, all neglect. The love of Christ was willing to be taken advantage of, so is the love of the Christian. And that, for me, sums up all of these. Your love is willing to be taken advantage of. I think about this. I've got a really good friend. He's been here before, Dan. Dan Chumley. When I left... Uh, the church in the Northwest, it was without question who should be called to be pastor there. It was Dan. Dan had been 
cleaning the church and the secretary for a number of years, keeping up with all the money, vacuuming the sanctuary at night, setting up chairs before worship the next morning, cooking, preparing the meals, getting all of this done, and the pastor would come in, preach, and be and leave. So when he left, I left at the same time without question, and they, they called me. Who should we call as pastor? I said, what do you mean, who should you call? You know who you should call. The man is gifted with the word of God that serves you day and night. They didn't call Dan. They called another guy. He stuck around for about a year. He left. Again, they form a pulpit committee. Dan's still there, still serving. They called Dan. No. They didn't call Dan. They called another guy. He came in. He left. Very shortly thereafter. It is a difficult church to preach in. To pastor in. This time, formed a new pulpit committee, and they called me. And I re remember this because we were in Washington, D.C., and I was walking around, picked up the phone. Hello, somebody I'd never known. She began to tell me she was on the pulpit committee, and she had just come to faith in Christ. <laughs> How awesome is that? She said, well, they wanted my perspective. I'm like, okay. She said, who should we call? I said, there's always only been one. I said, he's there every Sunday. They call Dan? No. It's funny, the pastor that they have now, when he's out, guess who they get to preach? Dan. He's still at that church. And Steve and I were marveling at this. He's still there being taken advantage of. That's love. He should have left a long time ago. I want to call them and go, okay, you've made your point. You're willing to be taken advantage of. Just leave. He's still there. He's still serving. He's still loving that body. That's Christian love. Take advantage of me. I've already been given everything. I already have the wealth of God. I already have Christ. What more do I need? Take. That's what these passages are talking about. That's what we see in our Lord in 1 Peter 2, where Peter says, For to this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, and when he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges Justly. That's Christ. That's His character. That's our character. The love of Christ, both experienced personally and expressed to others, again, is only possible for those who are born again, spirit-filled and willing to hear. Now, again, for us to understand this, Luke records the Lord's words, and he goes into three negatives to help express this as well. Three negative analogies, and it's interesting, as I'm continuing to work through this and look at the Greek, I, I think Luke wrote this, and I, know, I realize, you know, they, they didn't all sit around with a copy of the Word of God, and it was given from memory, but it was really written, be, it was really written to be memorized. I'm amazing, amazed at how well this forms out in, in the Greek language, but anyway, I'll show that to you, I'll translate it for you, or Transliterate it for you in just a second, but let me read 32 through 34. Here's the negative enforcement of what he said. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive... Again, ESV translates it credit, but it's actually benefit. What benefit is that to you, even sinners lend to sinners, to get back the same amount? But love your enemies and do good, lend, expecting nothing in return. In other words, it's three phrases that look like this. If even you, for even the. And it's formed perfectly with this phrase right in the middle, what benefit is that to you? And so you roll through all three, and it would be rather easy to memorize. If even you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. If even you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners 
love do the same. If even you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Notice verse 36. I didn't put it up there. Be merciful even, back to the word even, even as your father. In other words, here's your default. It's just to love those who love you. Your default is to do good to those who you know are going to do back. Your default is to lend to those who you know are going to cover and give it back. And he says, what in the world are you doing that you think is so special? The man that who hates God does exactly the same way. Why would you ever think that you have some benefit from that? In other words, your love, your good deeds, your generosity has no benefit because you behave no differently than the unregenerate. Your behavior is simply a reflection of the way that you're being treated. You're not different. I told you you'd need a helmet this morning. But he does talk about benefit in these passages. Notice here, there is one tremendous benefit from the text, verse 35. But love your enemies, do good, lend, expect nothing in return. And look what God says to us. And your reward will be great. In other words, God says the reward for modeling the character of the Father and the Son, the reward for that will be great. Absolutely tremendous. So the question is, here we go. Had you rather have justice, fairness, retribution, repayment, vengeance, or had you rather have reward from God? Had you rather respond and open your mouth and say what's on your heart, or be quiet, trust God, and wait on His reward? Which one had you rather have? You know, we, we get so caught in the here and the now, it seems like we can't escape the moment, doesn't it? We get offended, we get insulted, and we just can't get our minds around that moment to glorify God and receive it and respond in love. That's part of our fallen nature. And that's why you need to meditate long on the character of God and the mercy of God so that when you are reviled, you do respond in love because you have prepared your heart. Because if you're going to walk into that with a knee-jerk reaction, you're going to respond in your lostness, in your fallenness, rather. And you're not going to respond with love. So that's one benefit from being obedient to loving our enemies. Here's the other benefit, and it comes from the Apostle Paul. Jeremy read it to us this morning in Philippians 3. He says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, so that I may gain Christ, might be found in Christ, that I might know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Paul says, I've given up everything that I might gain him, be found in him, know him, and share in him. Specifically, share in his sufferings. So here's another reason for responding to those who hate you with love, other than reward. It is for the sake of greater fellowship with Christ. Paul's not the only one to talk about this. Peter talks about this as well. In some marvelous way, there's an extraordinary grace in closeness with Christ that can only be experienced by responding to personal hurt with love and trust. You will know God more intimately. You will understand Christ more deeply and you will be drawn to Him more closely because that's exactly what He did. And if you think about that, you would go, well, wait a minute, then we should welcome hurt. We should rejoice and leap for joy when people insult us. Yeah, exactly, that's what He just said just a minute ago when he started this sermon out. You should leap for joy because you have opportunity to draw closer to Christ. But what do we do? What do we do? In the flesh, we respond. You insult me. You just wait. I am so gifted personally. I'm telling you, I'm really gifted at responding with harder things than what's been said to me. I don't know where I got that ability. They come to my mind just like that. 
and they're really good. But they're really not of Christ. We respond in love even to those who revile us because we share more in our Savior. There is no greater reward than that. I want to conclude, and I have two or three points, so don't get too hopeful, with our failure to love. I thought this would be a good place to end because we do fail to love. What do we do when we fail to model the selfless love of Christ that we are commanded to model? In our failure, I thought this would be helpful. In our failure to love, we need to remind ourselves of a few things in order that we might not lose heart and give up. Because this is one of those things that you get hurt and you respond and then you remember the text and you just, your heart just falls, right? And you think of yourself as such a failure. So here are some things to remind yourself of when we fail to model the selfless love of Christ. Number one, when we pursue obedience to this command by our Lord to love our enemies, we need to remember that we are not pursuing justification. That is not what we are doing. We are not trying to make ourselves acceptable before God by loving our enemies. We are justified. We are accepted. We are made right before God because Jesus Christ never once failed to love. Never once, especially his enemies. I love this song. We sing it often. Jesus, thank you. And it goes, your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. And then we say, by your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. Your enemy, your enemy, you've made your friend. You see, that's what he did. And he did it marvelously and he did it wonderfully. And because of what he did, his love and his love for our enemies, you and I are justified before God because we have trusted in his love. Christ never failed to love. He perfectly obeyed the law of God. He fully met the righteous requirements of God. And his perfection and his perfect love is given to us or imputed to us through the gospel. And get this, you and I stand before God as though we had never failed to love. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And yet we stand before God justified in the righteousness of Christ as if I had never failed to love my most hateful enemy. The gospel is crazy. You need to repent and believe it. Second thing you need to remind yourself of, our pursuit of this kind of Christ love is necessary for our sanctification or our transformation. We are in the process of being made more like Him. The more we love, the more we are like Him. The more others see His love working in and through us, the more the Son is glorified. We pursue this kind of love because we are in pursuit of His glory. Third thing. In our failure to love, we must remember that we have been granted the grace of repentance. 1 John 1, 9. It was actually written to believers, not unbelievers. And it says, If you confess your sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, including all the times that we have failed to love those who are against us. So in your failure to love, remember, you're not trying to be accepted by God. You could never do that. You've only been accepted by God because of Christ's love. Therefore, you, you can love. Secondly, remember that we... When we fail, it's a process of becoming more like Christ. And God has given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness, so we can do it. But lastly, when you fail to love, remember, you've been granted the grace of repentance. If you confess, He forgives. 
And I don't know anyone in this room that does not need to be forgiven for their failure to be loving. So my last point might be a good place to start for you this morning. Probably you need to repent for your lack of love and start a new walking in the character of our great God. Love your enemies. Why? Because Christ loved you. Let's pray.